I now have the pleasure to welcome, of welcoming John Buchanan to the stage for our first presentation. John is renowned for coaching achievements in cricket, which included delivering Queensland its first Sheffield Shield title in 94 and 95, his first season with the Bulls. In his five years coaching the Bulls, they won the Sheffield Shield and the Mercantile Mutual Cup twice. In 1999, John became coach of the Australian cricket team and coached the team to over 50 World Cup wins in 2003 and 2007. He coached the Test team to Ashes victories in 2001, 02, 03, and in 06 and 07, which was a 5-0 whitewash. John's side set a number of world records in consecutive wins and highest batting scores. Since retiring as Australian coach, John has coached 2020 cricket in India and held roles on various international cricket boards. He wrote a book titled If Better Is Possible and set up his business, Buchanan Success Performance Coaching, to apply his successful sports coaching methodology to help individuals, leaders and teams create their own Everest. He does this through inspiring strategy, mobilising action and igniting results. To help identify your Everest this morning, please make welcome John Buchanan. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, Uncle Joe is correct, I, it is very bright out here, um, but um, I guess one of the things that I do have in common with both of you is that, um, well, what I don't have in common is that I can't swim 400 metres very quickly, <coughs> and uh, I certainly couldn't run the way that you ran uh, when you were at primary school or up until that period of time, but uh, I do relate to your father as a swim coach because uh, when I learned to swim, or not swim, uh, stop drowning basically, I was picked up by a chap uh, by the name of Nev Bruff, who was the father of Greg Bruff, who went on to be a, uh, an Olympic swimmer for Australia. And uh, this was my first meeting with water, uh, probably about age three or four down the Gold Coast. So he said, um, we're going to the deep end, uh, at this stage, I couldn't move because he was a big bear, so he had me. Uh, I guess I was uh, squirming a little bit, so he did the same thing, threw me out into the deep end, and it was about trying to get back to the side. He did have a big fish net, which was fortunate. Uh, he was able to scoop me and get me back in, so I'm here to tell the story. Uh, but it was certainly a different way of learning uh, how to swim and, uh, and, and water safety. Um, Uncle Joe, uh, I too at school... Uh, had many uh, a, uh, altercation, I suppose you could say, or, or difference of opinion with teachers, so I did end up getting a number of floggings as well. Um, they didn't tell me I had a small brain, but I think I demonstrated that quite regularly within the classroom, um, but enjoyed sport very much, and that kept me alive at, at school. Uh, we do also have another connection, and that is um, the beginning of uh, the Queensland Sheffield Shield campaign, began at St Edmunds College Outdoor uh, Centre up in the, wherever it was, up in the hills, and that's where we spent three or four days as a group and planned our Queensland way and uh, uh, did some adventure courses and finished up with a, a massive game of, of skirmish, which is amazing that some of us have still got eyes and, and, and ears and everything else that we, we went a bit wild at that stage. But anyway, it was a good start to... Um, the Sheffield Shield campaign. So mentioning that Sheffield Shield campaign, I thought I might uh, quickly remind some people about that because in a sense it's what uh, today's talk is going to be about. It is about this concept of Everest, or in my definition anyway, and it is around winning and what does winning actually mean. So let's have a, a quick recap and of course there is something coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, I believe, although, albeit that Queensland's trying to give New South Wales a bit of a chance by a few retirements and a few injuries here and there. Um, and I dare say there might be a couple of New South Welshmen in the audience, so uh, please make yourself known so all the Queenslanders can uh, make themselves known to you as well with a very hearty Queensland welcome. And uh, eventually they've done it. They've got the Sheffield Shield to uh, Brisbane with a great victory over South Australia in this Sheffield Shield final. The crowd, well, they've been warming up for about three days, I reckon, and uh, they're really ready to enjoy it. Terrific jubilation, the crowd charging onto the ground, and some of the uh, players, particularly the senior players, like Alan Border, Carl Rackerman, be great joy for them to get their hands on the, uh, the Sheffield Shield. 
the captain Stuart Law what a terrific job he's done and uh, what a great honor for him having uh, been given the job as Queensland captain in just his second season as skipper he's the man who brings it here for the first time so great jubilation for uh, Queensland and confirmation that they've well and truly beaten South Australia in this shield final to clinch the shield for the first time so um, hopefully there is a few people that were there and thereabouts it was one of those days where um, you know the, the crowd whatever the number was uh, you put an extra couple of noughts on it subsequent years that for the number of people that there so maybe there was 4,000 people there in the audience but eventually as you talk to people there was about 400,000 people there uh, it felt like it in the dressing rooms afterwards but this concept of winning and I, I guess we uh, could go back to the, the so-called quote owned by Vince Lombardi but in fact it was um, initially uh, said by Red Sanders and um, we all know that you know winning isn't everything it's the only thing so let's uh, spend some time trying to explore that today um, because those couple of images there might bring back a recent memory of uh, an incident over in South Africa and at a point in time in the dressing room in that Australian dressing room uh, on the third day uh, of that third test match somewhere there was a decision really to say um, winning at all costs is about us trying to get across the line how did they get to that decision uh, still probably is a, a question that we'll all ask and, and definitely a question I'm sure that Stephen Smith uh, David Warner and Cameron Bancroft are going to ask themselves for the rest of their lives but um so winning winning at all costs I think we all under, we would all appreciate that um, sport is simply that though. sport is simply about winning and losing uh, because that's how the rules are actually designed uh, the rules are not designed uh, in a sense to make sure that everybody crosses the line at the same stage um, they all get the same places no winning in uh, sport is about winning and losing winner or loser um, however if we take the rules away from that um, and it isn't necessarily about places and so on then that takes us into the whole world uh, I guess of again in my definition of recreation physical activity and so on so that's why we, we I think we're gathered here as not just a sporting fraternity but also a recreation fraternity as well so I think um, the overall comments about what happened in that Australian dressing room at that moment in time is that they were bloody idiots to do what they did to think that they could get away with uh, what they did apart from the fact that it was actually cheating so um, recently obviously we had the Commonwealth Games Brennan was there uh, getting that shiny piece of uh, metal uh, that he's about to show everybody out there proudly wearing it um, Commonwealth Games uh, prior to that there was Dr Alan Finkel speaking at this innovation uh, summit and he used uh, sport as, a, as an insight into Australia and what Australians can do and how innovative they can be and he reflected on the four minute mile barrier. Now uh, again there will be some in the audience that, uh, that can recall there was such a thing at one point in time um, and in May 6th 1954 an Englishman, um, Roger Bannister, broke the four-minute mile barrier for the first time ever. Hadn't been done before. There, that was the ceiling. He broke through that. Soon after, in, in June 21, I think, uh, John Landy did the same thing in Australia. And then on August the 7th, they were, they were pitted together in Vancouver uh, for the Empire Games, called the Miracle Mile. And you can... Um, you can jump on YouTube these days and, and grab it and it is um, just a wonderful spectacle to watch albeit it's in black and white and, and uh, um, when you get to see it you'll, you'll really appreciate I suppose how far um, sport has come albeit that that's uh, over what's that uh, 46 plus 18 that gets me to about 64 years wow that is a long time ago uh, but nonetheless the advances that have been that have been made since that point in time and, and just the pictures of how that was um, that particular event 
occurred and then the interviews afterwards, it's really worth, worth watching. But what um, Dr Finkel was discussing was the four points and, and this is really um, the basis of what I, I wish to talk about today and that is uh, winning will be as much about process as it is about result. It was very much the stance that I took as a coach with the Queensland team and then the Australian team about uh, process as important as result. Of course, results are still important. As I said before, uh, sport is about winning and losing. Business, in a sense, is about winning and losing. If you want to stay in business, you've got to remain profitable or you've got to at least maintain market share so that you can stay in business. Uh, as a coach, if you're not winning, or as an athlete, if you're not performing, you don't necessarily get the opportunity to play tomorrow. So it is, results are still essential. But it's all about how we get those results. So Finkel um, outlined these four uh, points that he thought were very important or, or were demonstrated by the likes of Bannister and Landy as they broke the four-minute mile barrier. And that was this aspiration, um, the desire, the passion, the belief that um, you can do things better than other people have done before. And they based that, or he, he suggested they based that on the fact that they were uh, well educated, uh, they used science and technology uh, to assist them because they're both uh, scientists and of course they used some data to um, enable that process or that eventual outcome. But I'd like to, um, I'd like to extend that today and suggest to you um, eight factors that I think are really important in terms of the way that you operate either as an individual, uh, the way that you operate as a leader, coach, um, parent, teacher, and uh, certainly the way that maybe your organisation uh, should think about the way it, it currently operates. So I'm going to take each of these uh, at a time and I should mention too uh, around uh, questions which was Brendan mentioned earlier. If you, if you do have a question, I think the process will be that we'll get through the presentation um, and then um, it, it'll be question time. So uh, if you do have a question, make sure you hang on to it, write it down, whatever you need to do, and then we'll, we'll grab it at the end and certainly allow sufficient time for that. So first point I will talk about is mindset. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about leadership, this concept of, of uh, collaboration, and then dive into things like facilities, the health agenda, uh, education agenda, talent, and then data. So that's kind of the picture where we're going. And as I said, my view on winning is that winning isn't at all costs, albeit that sport determines that there should be a winner and loser. Um, recreation, not so much. Physical activity, not so much. Albeit that it might be competition against yourself um, or competition that uh, you've set up uh, but it's, it's quite contained, not necessarily against an opposition. So let's explore some of these um, at the beginning. So this, the idea of, of mindset, I guess, is, is something that I encountered when I started coaching Queensland. So going back to that uh, first Sheffield Shield win. One could possibly take the view that Queensland, who had not won a Sheffield Shield for 69 years of trying, would do everything it possibly could to ensure that they could get a win. So when I was interview, interviewed for the role of coach and, and I was taking over from Jeff Thompson at that stage and um, again, hopefully not going to bore you too much uh, around uh, cricket but it's more setting the context, that, that Jeff Thompson was a, a luminary, obviously, uh, in cricket, uh, one of Australia's great test cricketers. And here I was coming in to uh, say why I should take on the role of coach instead of Jeff Thompson. And, um, you know, I played for Queensland 16 years beforehand, um, an unbelievably strong batting record, uh, 160 runs at an average of about 13, I think. Um, I was an all-rounder, so that meant I bowled, but the, the skipper at the time never gave me a bowl. Um, so 
my illustrious career finished after about seven or eight games. Um, and off I went and did other things. But 16 years on, I came back and said, well, I should be um, considered as coach of the Queensland team. To do that, though, it was important for me to demonstrate that I wasn't going to be looking at the way that Queensland uh, had chased this Sheffield Shield down the same way that everybody else had done so. Because, again, the question was, well, how are you going to win the Holy Grail? which was that Sheffield Shield. My view was, um, if that's what you want, well, you might as well continue on with Jeff Thompson or, or someone of that ilk. But in my mind, the picture was about uh, dominating domestic cricket for the next 10 years. That was, that was the picture. In a sense, that's the notion of, of Everest. You know, it's about having a, this picture in, in the, into the future and that's what you're going to chase down. Bannister and Landy, aspirational, breaking that four-minute barrier. Why couldn't it be done? Just because it hadn't been done, why couldn't it be done? Um, so that was, uh, I guess, my presentation to the, to the board uh, and the interview panel. And so, fortunately, somebody was listening and I, I was given the opportunity to coach the Queensland team. So it was then about taking that into the Queensland team because, again, most of the players uh, were all about just winning this Sheffield Shield, and understandably so. Uh, no question, as I said, it's, it's still very important to try and achieve those things. But my job was to get them out of that mindset about just winning, just trying to grab onto this, this Sheffield Shield. So it was all about then trying to work out, well, how do we win games? How do we play? And as I mentioned, we, it all started up at St Edmunds um, Outdoor Recreation Centre, where we pulled together a way of playing, a way of being, um, and hopefully then a, a means to measure that and, and to help that process. It was about the first time, or it was the first time that computer technology had been brought into assisting preparation for cricket. So, in a sense, that's a bit about the concept of if better is possible. Obviously, the next line in, in brackets is then good is not good enough. So no matter what we, what we do, we can always improve on what is our current standards or our current benchmarks. So it is about you, I think, with your boards, your committees, uh, the people in your organisation. Definitely uh, trying to, as the two ladies diagram says there, and hopefully everybody can see the two ladies, it is about actually looking at things from different perspectives, trying to look at things differently, trying to always, as they say, get up on the balcony and have a look down on the dance floor rather than being on the dance floor all the time, being consumed by your daily life. And most of you are extremely busy, either some of you are full-time in sport, others are volunteers in sport and recreation, which means you've got day jobs, you've got families, and then you're devoting yourself to this other thing um, which consumes a lot of time, a lot of energy. And, uh, and that busyness sometimes doesn't give you that opportunity to be able to step back and have a, have a broader look on what it is you're actually doing, how you're going about what you're doing. And certainly, if you can, how do you then influence those other people around you to take that different perspective on what it is you're doing? So, mindset. So, this is really, uh, as I just alluded to, um, in your role as a, as a leader of your organisation, there are just so many things going on even just within your own organisation, but in your whole life there are so many things going on. How do we actually cope with that? And I guess in my view on leadership is that it shouldn't be just left to you if you're the leader of the, the organisation, if you're a leader of an organisation or a club, um, being either CEO or the president, uh, chairman of the board, um, head coach, whatever it might be. Leadership comes down to, yes, certainly yourself, uh, walking the walk, talking the talk, cliche, but it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. You know, you deliver with integrity what you say you do and how you um, value certain things, principles that you, uh, you believe in, then you have to del deliver those all the time, consistently. And if you can't, then you need to be open enough to actually admit that and, sh and show that, that vulnerability that you have in terms of why maybe it happened and how you will actually go about addressing that into the future. 
But it can't be just about you, and that's why I say your, one of your key roles, in particular around this mindset idea, is to influence other people within your organisation. Um, and it is about actually everybody leading then, because you can't be everywhere and you don't want to be everywhere, uh, but you need other people to carry the banner, carry the flag, carry the, the values, principles and directions that you think are really important. So that is the responsibility of everybody uh, within your organisation. And of course, what we've seen of recent times, the, the cricket example, what we see in AMP, what we see in the banks, suggests to me that this notion that everybody leads is not happening. In other words, again, an old cliche, you know, the standards that you walk past are the standards you accept. And so if I'm leaving uh, an action or a behaviour of a person to a, a higher authority, uh, yet I have the capacity to at least engage another individual in a conversation about that, then I'm really just sending the message that everybody else is sending that that's tolerable or we'll sweep it under the carpet. And of course, this notion of um, change and uh, cultural change and so on, things just don't happen overnight. The, the ball tampering issue just didn't happen overnight, albeit that it was an instant in, in, uh, in cricket history. But the lead up to that was taking years. And it's a, it's a little creep, creep by bit by bit, little things are ignored behaviours are accepted, people are tolerated, decisions are made which all set a, a slightly different standard but of course that becomes the norm and, uh, and of course if those standards are on the decline then we can end up with a situation that we've seen uh, as I say both in business and in, and in sport. So uh, there are uh, a number of resources uh, around of course and, and, and flipping back into uh, what uh, Alan Finkel had said about um, Australian sport as an example, that education is certainly a way forward um, in terms of taking your organisation, taking yourself uh, into, a, into a different place where um, you're more educated in a sense around uh, things like governance. I'm involved with a, an organisation called the Governance Institute and they run their own programs as well. So there's a lot of information out there that I think uh, we can tap into, albeit again, remember, time is, is probably um, so limited. So again, it's a, a, around making some choices about where you can invest that time best so it can have ma maximum impact for you and maximum impact for your organisation. Um, collaboration. The notion that, um, yes, that we should as a, as a community, well, as a sport and recreation community, uh, we should collaborate far better than what we do. But we don't have to actually look too far, I don't think, uh, apart from sport and recreation. I just look in my street and, um, you know, it's not a very long street, um, but I don't really know. I know probably four or five neighbours um, and that's it. And, of course, everybody has a choice. You can... Um, choose to get to know your neighbours or not. But there does seem to me a, a growing sense that we are continually isolating ourselves uh, by way of uh, putting up barriers, um, by saying uh, we are too busy, we're not going to necessarily uh, commit to, in this case, the neighbourhood. Um, but on, on a broader scale, uh, I think uh, there's not a commitment to the nation and I don't want to get off into that tangent, but it is about actually, as an example, when you look in your neighbourhood, when you look at your, your school, um, when you look at your district or, or your uh, region, if there was a term called collaboration, how would you rate that on a scale of 0 to 10? Am I, are we uh, a collaborative community? And obviously a community suggests uh, just that very word. How well do we do this? Uh, what steps do we take um, to instigate this notion of collaboration? But there are so many learnings. When you look at the people in the room here, just for a start, the more that you're able to actually talk to each other about what it is that you're doing and how you're going about it um, so that others can learn from you or vice versa, uh, that seems to me to be really where sport and recreation should be at. 
Um, doesn't mean you have to agree with people, but at least begin the conversations and begin to share and, and discuss and debate. Uh, right, facilities. This is uh, an interesting one, and, and this takes me back, obviously, to 1982. So, um, after I'd left um, uh, cricket, I pre prefer to say I left, uh, rather than the selectors telling me it's time for you to leave. So, after I took that choice, um, I became a recreation officer at Townsville City Council, and that's where I first learnt a little bit about, um, I guess, facilities. I learnt a lot about... Um, recreation, parks, planning, whole different um, area of life for me and uh, it was really quite exciting. Um, however, I just married and uh, there was a real tug to, to still come back to Brisbane, back to family. So came back as a, a sport coordinator with the 82 Commonwealth Games of which these facilities were then just being built and uh, you know it's probably, I've only been back into this excuse me, theatre probably once or twice since then, but just the notion of, in 82, um, how they put Chandler together uh, is amazing, really. And uh, Belmont just down the road, how that sort of morphed from um, a couple of eucalypt trees and a, a couple of mounds into a shooting complex. Um, but I, I think um, what becomes really interesting to me with facilities and um, I, I spent a little bit of time reading uh, an American journal, Sport Techie, um, which is really the impact of technology on sport. And this is everything from individuals, you know, wearables, um, data gathering, uh, all the way up to facilities and where they will talk about um, fan engagement fan experience. And so we were at our first presentation in Mackay and again that was almost one of my uh, first introductions into this notion of shared facilities, Harrop Park up there which is a fantastic facility. We went there to play cricket against Sri Lanka and here was a golf course all around the, the, uh, the cricket ground. So this concept about how we actually use space how do we share the space, how do we maximise the space, how do we optimise the space, I think must be on uh, your minds uh, consistently and constantly. Um, you know, we have s school facilities and of course there's lots of rules and regulations and red tape and so on, but, but they sit there often uh, unused. And then when we talk about the, you know, the GABA and the precinct and, and redeveloping that sort of thing. So, how does technology begin to impact on that? Can there be um, open air th cinemas in there? Can, with all that open space, and, and we're on about energy and finding new ways of um, creating energy, um, can that open space that, that uh, you have, or some of you might uh, be involved with, can we turn that into, uh, you know, use of solar cells or, I don't know, wind turbines, have no idea. Um, but it, again, it goes back to this concept of mindset. Can the facilities that you have or that you need, can you find ways of actually um, generating revenue while you're asleep, while you're not on the facility? Is there ways and means that that can, as I say, develop a new revenue stream for you in some way, shape or form? Uh, but that may require a lot of collaboration, a lot of sharing, a lot of interaction with different agencies. But generally sport occupies a lot of space which is not um, overutilised all the time. The health agenda. And I, and I think there are, it's kind of like a triangle. We've got sport and recreation, we've got the health agenda and the next slide will be about the education agenda. And it just seems to me that that's where our great collaboration should be. Um, because again, health and education, no matter uh, what budget uh, you operate from, whether it be state, federal or local, are significant um, resources or, or places where resources uh, can be found. So how does sport and recreation really piggyback, align itself, um, work with, um, health 
and of course um, obesity is one of those um, titles at the moment that everybody's wanting to cope with because it, again it is about the impact of obesity on our health system over a period of time. Mental health is another one that is, is um, very much in the news. How do we actually address mental health? Well, it, it does always seem to me that sport and recreation should be talked about as a means to assist the health problems if those are two of the ones that become significant on, on our agenda as a nation. We know, and I think there is sufficient research around to suggest that active, healthy uh, children generally can lead to active, healthy uh, adolescents and so on. Uh, when I was involved with the Queensland Government, I was, did a, as I mentioned, did a few different things and uh, eventually we came back to Queensland having been away and I was managing a program called Aussie Sport uh, for the Government in uh, the early 90s. And again, the, the notion of Aussie Sport was in a sense, um, uh, it, it was born out of, I think, the Daly Physi Physical Education Program, which in itself was born out of the National Fitness Program. Um, but Aussie Sport was very much about encouraging young children to enjoy their first experiences in a sport or an activity. And uh, again, I think we would all appreciate, and we've all either had children go up through um, clubs and so on, uh, or we do have them currently, that if we can actually provide really enjoyable experiences for young children in their first contact with sport, apart from being thrown into the deep end of a swimming pool, um, then it's more likely that they'll want to come back, back again next, next Saturday or next week and the week after. And of course, part of that experience is also about us being good coaches, good teachers, good parents, uh, to enable that to occur as well, uh, because it has to be fun for us just as much as it has to be fun for the children. But Aussie Sport was always about that. It was about actually modifying equipment, rules, facilities, regulations, etc. Also, parent behaviour to ensure that that was uh, very much a part of the child's experience. So, and again, we, we know, I think, when we, we would have first-hand experience that when we have young children who are exposed to, to art or to music, um, you know, to language, that they pick things up very, very quickly and it's, it's almost there for life, provided that there is the encouragement and the support for that to occur, uh, continue to occur. And so sport, physical activity is no different. In fact, it's physical activity um, sport is just uh, an add-on after that and I think that's one of the downsides of um, our early experiences which, which probably takes me to the education agenda is that we are now asking more and more young children to play sport without the fundamental skills to deal with what the sport is actually asking him to do. And of course, in my view, that's begun because within the education system, we hear about the crowded curriculum. Um, there is no room or little room for a physical education program, certainly at primary schools. Um, the number of phys ed teachers reduced quite significantly into schools. Uh, the access to physical education programs, uh, whether you're metropolitan or regional, is reducing all the time uh, because we want to be the, the smart country, the smart state, and there is certainly nothing wrong with that. Indeed, we should be aiming for that. But as a community, as a sport and recreation community, changing our mindset to work out ways and means that we can integrate sport into the daily curriculum uh, seems to me to be pretty important to the future. And again, when you think of your own sport, your own recreations, can't you see how it impacts on virtually every piece of curriculum that young children uh, would learn from an early age? So whether it's mathematics, we've just heard about Uncle Joe running around a track, we've just heard about Brendan swimming up and down a swimming pool, 
So there are things like measures there, there are times, there are distances. So all that becomes part of your, a, a mass curriculum. And then of course, beyond that, there's some history about swimming. There's some history about Aboriginals in sport. So that lends itself to um, social studies or whatever that the topic is these days. Sport and recreation have an immense um, opportunity, I think, to really um, enhance uh, the curriculum as children, primary school and then into secondary school, work their way through their education process. So to me, uh, as I said, three points to the triangle. Sport and recreation with a, a different way of looking at how they deliver or how you deliver your services and two of the key uh, components in that where resources really reside can be health and education. How do we get on and piggyback with them to deliver what we want to deliver? Uh, and again, um, all various um, uh, ways and means that we can continue to uh, upgrade our knowledge. And this is obviously from a coaching perspective, um, but nonetheless indicates ways and means that we, we have of actually improving uh, ourselves all the way along the line to deliver the, the services that we wish. So this is one I, I'm very keen to throw as a challenge and I, and I guess how I see my role today for you is hopefully um, challenging some of your thoughts or at least uh, throwing some ideas your way that leads maybe to some debate or discussion or thinking, not only while we're here, but when you leave here and, and head back into your, your office uh, or into your, um, your particular sport or recreation. But in this case, it's, I guess, one that I feel very passionate about and, and it revolves around tipping talent, if you like, on, it, on its head. And I listened to Brendan there before and as he said, uh, Beijing was where he uh, jumped in and, uh, you know, was on the top of the roller coaster and then come the final time he, he uh, didn't perform as well as he would have liked to, nonetheless still, in terms of a result, but at the same stage had a fantastic result in terms of beating his personal best by 13 seconds. Um, however, he learned from that and he's got better and better to the point where he's undefeated now. Now, without uh, putting Brendan on the spot, he's a, he's a good-looking young bloke, uh, but uh, late 20s, early 30s? 25. There you go. Early 20s. <laughs> 25, but 25 and with a huge career in front of him. So when I look at cricketers and I look at any athlete and, I, and you, and you um, read... Uh, some statements about teams and how they're going, how individuals are going, and about rebuilding and, and all these sort of things. And it's about, you know, we're bringing young players in, and we've, they've got to take time to learn uh, how to play the game, but, you know, in two or three years' time, you know, we'll be up there punching away, which, which is fine. Then on a, in another breath, you'll hear about this notion of uh, sports transition, you know, so and admittedly I'm kind of talking almost at one end, if you like, an elite end, because that's what we hear about. But nonetheless, it's happening all the way through you, uh, whether you're at club, club land or whether you sit somewhere in the middle of those. Um, it's happening everywhere. It's just that elite is where the news is and that's what people grab onto. Um, but, of course, what happens when I finish my sport? You know? What happens when I retire? Where do I go? What do I do? Who's looking after me? How well am I prepared to do that? And there are obviously a number of cases of people are, are, are successful at doing that, but there's equally a number of uh, cases that they're, they're not. And in fact, the Australian Sports Commission has now appointed a lady, Maddie Clements, who's looking into this whole area of transitioning in sport. And it's not just for an athlete, it's obviously for coaches, it's for officials, it's for everybody. So if you give so much time to the sport, what have you given to the rest of your life so that you're prepared for the rest of your life? And again, as we know, from an athlete's point of view, it can be taken away from you at the drop of a hat. In my case, selectors just didn't see my ability, um, but through injury or other circumstances. So um, it always seems to me then that 
while we have a whole range of talented athletes that are coming through our education system, why don't we actually continue to encourage them to do what they should be doing, and that is still enjoying their, their youth, their life. Um, some, some sport and recreations may dictate that that's not possible because there are physical dimensions to their sport. But otherwise, then go on and get your apprenticeship. Go on and get your uh, degree. Then go on and work. Get out in the real world for a while. So by the time you're 25, you may not necessarily have experienced an Olympics. Uh, but to me, technically, in your sport, you will be better because you've actually been applying your technical skills for a period of time, albeit maybe not at the highest level, but you're actually in a, in, in a place where you can test them on a regular basis. You can experiment far easier than you can at, a, at an international level or at a higher level. Physically, it seems to me you've always got to be stronger. Now, maybe there are some sports and recreations that don't require strength, but most will, but it may not necessarily be stronger. It may be that you, you've become far more... Uh, knowledgeable about your body and how it operates, so you actually um, can prepare it better for the demands of what it is that you're going to ask it to do. And then mentally, it, again, it seems to me the older that you are, the more uh, emotionally stable you are, the, the more uh, mature you've become, the more experiences of life that you've had, the more people that you've interacted with. And then tactically, um, it just seems with that emotional intelligence and being around the sport longer, you're able to make better decisions on what should be done in the course of uh, doing your sport. So, tipping it on its head, I'm suggesting that, really, why should we be putting our money, all our money into young athletes? Why wouldn't we be encouraging them to pursue their sport? Yes, uh, to a certain level, without huge demands of representative sport, uh, but get on with their life. And, of course, that may mean we lose some because they might decide, well, sport's not for me or that, th that's not the path I want to go. I really enjoy my education and that's great. That's fantastic because it is about the person. It's not about the sport. It's about the person. So that's one thing that I, I'd pose to you that um, we should maybe be encouraging our athletes to come into sport at a lot of later age, but then they can stay longer as well. They can stay in their sport longer or they have uh, a better capacity to make choices because they also now have degree, work experience, whatever it is behind them. The second thing around um, this notion of talent is the concept of specialisation which sort of falls hand in hand with what I'm saying. And that is sports, I think, recreation, but it generally it'll be the sports. Sports are our, our own worst enemies um, because, again, if we go to that young, talented athlete that young, talented athlete will generally be talented across a range of different sports. And so what sports are very good at doing is saying, yes, you can play a whole range of sports, that's fantastic, um, you know, good for your social development, good for your skill development, um, good for your emotional development. But, of course, you realise our season starts here, you know, pre-season, and we need you actually to be here for pre-season. And then, uh, you know, that's the length of the season. Oh, does it overlap with that other sport? Ah, oh, well, look, you might have to make a choice here. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, if you're not picked up at this stage, we, we really can't necessarily guarantee that you'll actually be seen over a period of time. So probably in your best interest to, to think seriously about this and, and maybe you should become part of our program. So, specialisation in sports, I think, should be left as late as possible. And that means sports have to think, going back to mindset again, about the way that they're actually going to uh, deliver their sporting products. Uh, do they need the length of season? Uh, certainly for, for young people. Do they need the length of season? That they Would young athletes be far better prepared to play their, your sport again, when they're older, if they've got a broader base of physical skills, if they've got a broader base of social skills, if they've got a broader base of uh, coaches and people that they've interacted with. So specialisation across sports. And then specialisation in sport. So the longer uh, time that we can obviously 
ensure that our young athletes, and again, they don't have to be elite, they can be at any age, um, get to experience a whole range of different roles within a team, I think far better for the individual, may not necessarily reflect in terms of results for a, 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 an underage team as they progress in their local competition, but in the end, really, that seems to be pretty insignificant. Again, we're about the customer, if you like. The customer is the young child, the young person coming through, and the more that we can actually help and grow and develop them, surely that's our job in sport and recreation. And um, lastly, um, this whole notion of data, this whole notion of data and, and what it is and how we use it. Um, again, as we're saying in um, Mackay, and, and you'll get some uh, talk about this later on today from uh, one of the other speakers, um, how data is collected, how we use technology these days, how we're actually probably um, well known to Mr Facebook or uh, Mr Instagram better than uh, we're known to our parents sometimes. So the ability, though, for you to um, uh, sort of uh, uh, coordinate and, and um, um, merge the data that you have either within your sport, recreation or region, but across sport, across organisations, you have mammoth amount of data. Now, Again, there's the whole sensitivity around what do you, what can you use, how can you use it, um, but nonetheless, that seems to me to be something that really needs to be being spoken collectively, collaboratively, by sport and recreation, because you become a powerful unit then within our community, rather than isolated organisations with with certain amounts of data. So how how do we use that for the benefit of not only um, the people who are involved in, in your sport or recreation, but external to that. How do we how do we do that? Because the data is seems to be that's the world game at the moment. Um, and again, it's about what's important data, and um, if we've got it, what does it mean? How do we analyse that? Because you'll have a range of of trends, if you like, if, if we were able to gather all this um, about the way people operate. We don't have to wait for a census. We don't have to wait for the Sports Commission to be um, pulling something together. Uh, but maybe if they were actually working with yourselves and yourselves working with each other, we could actually be providing our Australian community with some really great insights into maybe some future trends and the way that we should um, support those um, or indeed um, plan for those. So. In the end, um, your job, like all of us, that, that get to um, influence individuals and particularly younger people, is to leave a, a legacy. It is about, um, as the cliche again goes, for the time that you've had the ability to influence somebody, that time should mean that they're better for that experience. Um, from the time they met you to the time um, maybe that um, relationship uh, ends in whatever shape or form. So we're about trying to provide experiences and um, directions and support and um, guidance for younger people, people that we influence, people in our clubs that show that sport and recreation has an unbelievably significant benefit uh, for our community. And so here are a couple of things. If I went back into that, the eight factors that I had, when you leave today, and, and you're here for most of the day, so tomorrow you go back into the office, and as we know, it's been, you know, we all feel great having been here, and we've talked to people, and we get an injection of, you know, uh, life and energy and enthusiasm, and yes, we're going to do A, B, C, and D. And then, of course, you get back into life again. You get back into the reality of the world, uh, which really is a bit of a, a hard place to be. But so what will you commit to? 
uh, from today that you will do tomorrow? What will you do in terms of the governance of your organisation? And that could be just simply something about you. That could be simply something about if I'm the minute taker, I will make sure that the minutes are accurate and are delivered on time. Simple as that. So people get the right information in adequate time. Um, what are you going to do about your facilities? You know, either that you have or that you need and how are you going to think about those? Are you sharing those in a, in a way that um, is beneficial not only to you but to those around you? Um, or if you need facilities, well, how do we go about looking for those? How do we search those out? How do we um, work with other groups to make sure that we can uh, have uh, a shared arrangement? Don't know whether specialisation is, is your bailiwick, but um, what does your sport recreation do about it right now? Is it again the best way that you're encouraging young people uh, to be involved in your sport and recreation? Are you fitting them out for life? Are you encouraging them then to be physically active? Doesn't mean that they have to be in a sport or a recreation club or per se, but are they enjoying this notion of physical activity and they see it as part of their, their daily life into the future? And um, therefore collaboration sort of sits or weaves its way through all this because again, very difficult for you as a, a single organisation, single club, single uh, leader of your, your um, club or organisation to do it by yourself. Who do we need to speak to? How do we speak to people? Um, how do we actually come together and here's a, here's a forum that again uh, can present some opportunities at least to begin that process. So um, that's it for me, I've taken a fraction longer than uh, I thought but um, very happy now to uh, answer any questions if there are any questions from the audience but thank you very much for your time uh, this morning. Hopefully at least there might be one or two challenges in there or a couple of ideas um, that are at least stimulating for you. And again, I can only say that the, the following speakers that are coming up are going to be really, really uh, exciting. Brendan's doing a great job, so he'll continue doing a great job. And, uh, and I wish you all the very best for the rest of the day, but happy to answer a couple of questions now if there are any. I'd like to thank John for his talk. And uh, all I can think about is he just gave me a 50 minute lecture of something that I learnt in uni over six classes and I'm just wondering why they just didn't bring him in to teach us in one class and save me all those three hour lectures for the week. Because um, no, I really enjoyed that. Thanks very much, John. Okay. And um, well, I'm happy to open it to questions now until the break starts at 10. So if anyone's got any questions, we'll put your hand up and try and get a mic to you in order so that we can hear it. John, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I'm Lyndon Kurth and uh, I'm from a karate club. In uh, karate, the cultural aspects of the sport and how a club operates are considered to be very important. And I was interested on your comment that cultural change, for good or bad, happens slowly and it creeps in. I'm wondering how you would suggest you manage the um, deterioration of a culture, the, the things that start to relax and then gradually um, snowball into a major problem. Do you look for warning signs or do you adopt a more positive attitude towards reinforcement of beliefs and values and how do you achieve that? Yes, look, yeah. Um uh, very good question and um, it's not an easy exercise because part of that is an assumption that people will actually see a deterioration in the first place. Um, but um, I, I guess from my own standpoint as a coach, if I was trying to um, engender a certain culture within uh, our cricket teams or organisations, I will generally always try to highlight the good stuff that, well, at least I believe that the, the key values that the organisation or the team needs. And as soon as I could see those, that's something that I would champion and I would, uh, you know, reward or recognise however I could do that. Um, 
And to assist that, it becomes really important then that you're, you, you have some disciples, what I term disciples, within your um, team or organisation. And, and those people are not necessarily uh, yes people, but you know they're actually aligned uh, philosophically and, and value-wise. So f for me, so within that Australian cricket team, the new coach uh, for Australia was one of those people. I could rely on him um, at any time to be talking a similar sort of story with the people that he might have been interacting with at any time. Um, and Adam Gilchrist would be the same, Matthew Hayden, etc. So it becomes really important that you're not, again, as we were saying before, you can't do this by yourself. You just can't do it by yourself. So, so leadership is leadership in everyone. Everyone needs to be a leader. But, of course, uh, you can be led in certain different directions, which you're alluding to. So my view is always to try to find and, and support those people who I believed were um, so important into, well, we turned it to baggy green culture, really in, in enhancing that and making sure it was as stable as possible. There, there will always be some warning signs because there will always be some individuals that either step outside that or, or collectively we do some things that are not right. And we, we were uh, definitely guilty of that ourselves, you know, at different stages. Uh, we were called ugly Australians because of the way, the aggressive way that we played the game. Um, so there are sometimes signals that will come in from outside and sometimes there are signals from inside. And I think your role as, as a leader then is to actually assess those and this is about being on the balcony rather than on the dance floor because if you're on the dance floor, you're never going to see them. You're just never going to hear them because you're so immersed in what you're doing and you're so um, passionately believing in what you're doing that any sort of external or even internal perceived criticism is pushed to one side. So it becomes important for you either to be able to move outside and have a look back in or always try to encourage outside views whom you respect uh, to come in and look at what you're doing. So um, again, when I was coaching, Wayne Bennett was one person that I would talk to or always maybe encourage him to come in and have a look through different eyes about what's going on. So a couple of thoughts there about maybe how you could address that team culture. But it, culture is something, as I said, it, it does change for the negative or the positive on, on a slowly, slowly basis. Um, and just because, again, things are heading in the right direction or the wrong direction doesn't mean they can't be changed immediately, you know, in terms of changing direction, not necessarily over a longer period of time where you, you now have a, a way of being. But if you believe you've got something in place that's good, it can be pulled down reasonably quickly. Does that help? Yep. Oh, I, you, no more, please. <laughs> hey, overcome. We've got three questions, guys. Come on, use them up. There's only three. That's it. Oh, hi, John. My name's Kerry. I'm from a local um, cricket club, actually, in Brisbane. And um, our claim is Joe Burns, who uh, recently participated in the uh, Sheffield Shield. My question is about um, sharing facilities and space and being a collaborative community. Um, many of the sporting clubs, probably people here, who hold facilities and have leases on facilities, our operating costs are becoming increasingly expensive, um, probably far outweighing our costs for that fees can generate. Uh, this is also, um, we have less volunteers or people with time to help. How, you talk about having collaborative communities and finding those revenue streams through other communities, Often the facilities aren't purpose-built for that, so it's very hard to bring in those revenue streams. How do you find a balance with those leaseholds with Brisbane City Council and so forth to try and find a balance where they can be afforded and we can maintain those facilities without increasing uh, registration fees for parents? Wow, that sounds one for the, uh, the local sport and recreation officials in here. Uh, <laughs> But um, I, you know, I don't really have any, any great ideas there except to say that if you were negotiating with the Brisbane City Council, the state government, um, my view wouldn't be you wouldn't be going in there just as a career club um, to negotiate that. I'd, I'd be, whoever else is potentially in that area, 
I'd be going in as a, a collective group um, and, and show some sort of uh, planning around how we've actually sat together. And, and you might already have done this, I, I don't know. Because, again, cr knowing cricket probably better than some other sports, cricket is one of those sports that takes up a heck of a lot of space. Um, and so, again, cricket may actually have to rethink the way that it actually plans its own facilities to deliver the game of cricket. Um, you know, so I, I think, therefore, um, that does require cricket to think a little bit differently. It does require then cricket to reach out to other potential uh, users of the facility. And I think it does mean that your approaches, rather than individual, although albeit sometimes it will have to be, but the more community oriented you can make it, the, the more people that you can bring into that uh, discussion that you're about to have with, with a council or a local government. It seems to me it gives you more power, more leverage anyway, uh, to begin to maybe develop something that may work in, in your favour. Now, other alternative revenue means, I, you know, I don't, I don't know, I, I don't know, but again, it seems to me that the more people that you put in the room um, that are maybe wanting to share this facility or use it in some way, shape or form, and if everybody has a mind, an open mindset about, well, the game doesn't have to look exactly the same as what it does at a senior level, but still we can de deliver on this sport, then maybe it does give you a greater opportunity to look at ways and means of changing, uh, changing revenue streams without impacting upon the, the users. Because again, <coughs> as, I would, as I would see, um, as I look at elite sport across all sports these days, um, you know, clubs are just being killed, grassroots are being killed because the major sports are taking all the money up into senior ranks. Um, what did I just... Uh, which, which was another example. Rugby Union, I think it was, um, who are talking about the fact that as a national body they don't have a very good relationship with Australian schoolboys. Is somebody in rugby here? There must be. So tell me if I'm Pete, tell me if I get off on the wrong track here. But um, uh, so they don't talk to schoolboys rugby uh, well enough, which is a problem in itself. So now they're going to insert uh, a 19s or a 20s or a 23 competition in the middle. So what does that mean? More money into a, a select group of people, which takes it away from grassroots. So again, it does seem to me that those sports who put in layers of competition in between club, domestic, international, are basically raping um, um, club land, grassroots. So that while you, you have the issue of dealing with that community level, the sport really needs to address the fact, and I'll stay in cricket because I sort of know that a little bit, um, that they don't need um, the... Um, Futures League, you know, this is the, 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 the level between club cricket and Sheffield Shield cricket, if you like. They don't need that. What they do need is to strengthen club cricket, you know, and put some money back in there. So get rid of the, the huge amount of money they put into that. Australia A, they don't need to spend as much time or effort and money in doing that if they make sure that their domestic competition, again, is as strong as maybe what it should be. So... There are bigger issues that are not in your control, um, but uh, collectively, maybe at your level, there are things that you could do about thinking about the game slightly differently, maybe, uh, bringing more people to the table, uh, which would help generate um, different ideas, but then as a collective unit with some sort of plan, maybe that's a better way of leveraging what it is you're trying to do. Okay, we're going to have to wrap it up there, guys, I think, so we can get you some morning tea, so we can get some fuel back into us, so we can come back in and listen again. Uh, thanks very much to join again. Okay.